From disruptive technologies like generative AI to career transitions to becoming a parent, change is all around us. But if you're like most people, you inherently try to avoid or resist it as much as possible because it's a threat to our stability and even our sense of self. Well, executive coach and author Brad Stahlberg argues that we should flip that script and learn to embrace change so that we can grow from life's constant instability. That's the whole premise of his new book, Master of Change, about embracing rugged flexibility so that we can weather life's storms and come out better on the other side. Hello, internet friends. Welcome back to the channel. And in this video, I'm gonna kick off a new book club series where I talk about and review different self-help business and productivity books. It's a little different than my Obsidian videos that I've been sharing lately, although as I shared in a previous video where I walk through my book note-taking process, my notes do eventually end up in Obsidian and spark ideas for a lot of the things that I end up creating. The ideas I get from reading books are the mental Lego bricks that I use for just about everything that I make. But I've been reading and reviewing books for a very long time on the Bookworm podcast, 180 episodes now. And I thought it could be cool to share some of those insights and learnings here via short video summaries. So for this first book club video, I'm gonna be looking at Master of Change by Brad Stolberg. This is a pretty short book, but that doesn't mean that it's a quick read. It's actually pretty dense. There's an introduction where we're introduced to the idea of rugged flexibility, three main parts where we examine a rugged and flexible mindset, a rugged and flexible identity, and rugged and flexible actions. And then there's a conclusion with five questions and 10 tools for developing rugged flexibility in our own lives. Let's start with the introduction. Now, unlike most introductions, this one is pretty meaty. The author introduces us to the concept of a disorder event, which is something that fundamentally shifts our experience of ourselves in the world that we inhabit. Now, sometimes these disorder events are individual, like a career transition, which is especially relevant for me right now, attempting to make a go of it as a full-time creator. But sometimes they're communal, like the COVID-19 pandemic. And while most of us would prefer to avoid these disorder events, they actually happen all the time. In fact, on average, we will experience 36 different disorder events during our lifetime. Now, when those disorder events occur, we usually respond in one of four ways. We attempt to avoid change or refuse to acknowledge it. We actively resist change. We sacrifice agency amidst the chaos, or we try to get back to where we were. Now, the process of getting things back to the way that they were is called homeostasis, which is a scientific word for the process of things going from order to disorder and then back into order again. But change is actually neutral and things rarely go back to the way that they were before. So the author argues that we should instead embrace the concept of allostasis, which is stability through change as things go from order to disorder to reorder. And that last part is important because it's not gonna be exactly the same as it was before. But healthy systems learn to adapt and embrace this change, which allows them to become rugged and flexible enough to adapt to their new situation. I think this is a really powerful introduction. And honestly, if you stop reading right here, you'd still be getting your money's worth. I think this is a really cool idea and it's presented extremely well it lays a very solid foundation for the rest of the book. There's no fluff in this introduction and I absolutely love it. Now next is part one, Rugged and Flexible Mindset. And in the first chapter, which is titled Open to the Flow of Life, the author shares about how resisting change can actually cause psychological and physical suffering. Now I never really thought about this before, but it makes a lot of sense. When something is changing and there's absolutely nothing we can do to keep it the way it was, then that can make us feel powerless and hopeless. And it's a very compelling case that's laid out here for accepting change driven home by the opposite of rugged and flexible, which the author says is weak and rigid. I like the juxtaposition of this and this description a lot because it highlights the importance of being willing to change our minds about things. You see, when things are weak and rigid, there's no room for variation. Everything that can cause disruption is viewed as a monumental threat to our existence. And it's a frustrating way to look at the world, especially when you consider that things are never gonna go quite the way that you expect them to. Now that actually leads into chapter two, which is titled, Expect It To Be Hard. This chapter talks about how the brain is actually a prediction machine, and it's constantly trying to figure out what's gonna happen next. The author talks about how our happiness is determined by the difference between reality and our expectations. Now, if reality exceeds our expectations, then we're happy. 
but if expectations exceed reality, then we're frustrated. And add to this the emphasis that we have in Western culture to be happy all the time, you've got a recipe for disappointment. In fact, the author even says that the worst way to be happy is to try to be happy all the time. But that's exactly the pressure our society places on us. Then when things don't go like we want them to and we experience pain, the resistance we apply only serves to multiply our suffering. Now the solution to this is not expecting it to be puppies and rainbows all the time. I love the fact that the author brings up Viktor Frankl here, as his book, Man's Search for Meaning, was incredibly powerful and one that I definitely recommend everyone read at some point in your lifetime. Viktor Frankl was a World War II concentration camp survivor who came up with this idea of tragic optimism, which is basically the ability to maintain hope and find meaning in life despite its inescapable pain, loss, and suffering. So while none of us want pain and suffering and we would choose to avoid it if possible, the fact that it will exist at some point and at some level and then realizing that it's a normal part of the human existence allows us to navigate it more effectively. Now, the second part of the book is about rugged and flexible identity, and chapter three begins by encouraging us to embrace a fluid sense of self and identity. And I can relate to the author's story here about suffering injury as a runner and having to find a new identity as I went through something very similar while training for my first half marathon. My patella tendon actually slipped off my kneecap days before the race. Now, I finished anyways because I'd been training for this race for almost a year and a half. But I remember the moment I crossed that finish line and immediately felt that dread by having to answer the question, now what? Because my identity was as a runner, so the natural thing would have been to run another race. But I knew that I had months of physical therapy ahead of me, so that really wasn't an option. And like the author, I had to embrace a new identity that was broader than just the physical activity and realize that who I am is multifaceted. Now in this chapter, the author talks about a couple of different definitions of self, including the conventional self, which is present, individual, and stable, and then the ultimate self, which is the self connected with everyone and everything around us and is always changing. Now at this point, I completely expected the author to drive this home with something like the story of the ship of Theseus, but to my surprise, he didn't do that. Very briefly, the legend of Theseus's ship goes something like this. Theseus was the man who slew the Minotaur in Greek mythology, and he had a ship that when they came back, they kept it at the museum, and slowly over time, parts of the ship had to be replaced. Over the course of time, every piece of the ship was replaced, but the argument is that the identity of the ship goes beyond the ever-changing parts. And it's the perfect complement to the arguments the author is making in this chapter. But unfortunately, he never went there, and I found the terms that he used for the different versions of self never really clicked for me. I feel this chapter would have benefited from a strong conclusion, and the story of Theseus's ship would have been perfect here. Now, the next chapter, chapter four, is titled Rugged and Flexible Boundaries. And this, honestly, is my favorite chapter in the whole book because this is where he dives into the topic of personal core values. Core values are a really big deal for me, and my wife and I even have family core values that we've printed and are hanging on our living room wall. Now, the author talks about how core values are guiding principles that can serve as a rudder to help steer you and are a source of stability during a time of change, and I completely agree with that. I love the way that core values are presented here and the encouragement that the author gives us to define our own core values as something that you can always control, no matter how crazy life gets. I agree with the advice to select three to five and to write a sentence about each, but I did find myself wishing he would have gone a little bit deeper on this topic because it's so powerful. The question he gives us to ask, how might I move in the direction of my values, is a really good one, but I feel like there's a lot more that could be unpacked here. Now, to be fair, it's possible he goes deeper on this in his other books, which I haven't read yet, but I found myself at first really excited and then a little bit disappointed from the lack of depth on the topic in this chapter. Now, the last official part of the book is part three, Rugged and Flexible Actions, and it starts with chapter five, which is titled Respond, Not React. Now, the basic idea here is that while we can't necessarily control what happens to us, we can control how we respond to it. So the author gets deep into some brain science here and talks about the rage and seeking pathways, though I found myself disagreeing a little bit with how the science was presented. Now, I'm a bit of a nerd. Neuroscience is a fascination of mine, and I've done a bit of study here myself. So I wasn't a huge fan of how it was presented in this chapter. Now, while I do agree that the pause is the critical response that's needed when things go sideways, 
I think that the pathways are much more connected than they're presented here. And I also like the term emotional hijacking to describe what triggers that fight versus flight response, as I think it more accurately describes what's actually happening in the brain. But the overall message of not reacting right away when an upsetting event happens is fundamentally a good one and one that everybody can benefit from. Now, the last chapter of the book is chapter six, titled Making Meaning and Moving Forward. And this is all about recognizing that we're not really in control and letting growth and meaning appear organically over time instead of trying to manufacture it. Now, I believe purpose is important and we all need to find our why, but I like the advice here not to try and ascribe meaning to things artificially. And I also agree with the author's argument that self-help isn't enough and that we need others more than we sometimes realize. While not the emphasis of the book, community and connection are extremely powerful. And I also like the description of fake fatigue, which manifests as exhaustion that accompanies big life changes. Now, I've experienced this myself lately, and being aware of it can help you realize the difference between fake fatigue and pure burnout. So this is a really important topic we need to understand. The conclusion is pretty simple and straightforward, delivering on the promise of the title, which is five questions and 10 tools to help you become rugged and flexible. Now, while the tools are simply the strategies defined in the rest of the book, I did like the questions here a lot. Personally, I believe that if you wanna get clarity, you need to learn to ask the right questions. And I believe that the ones that are shared here at the end of this book are helpful in setting the stage for effective thinking time. Now, as far as style and rating, I really like this book. I've got a few nitpicks with certain things in it, but overall, I think it's really good. And I think that it could benefit from a few things that would help solidify the arguments the author is making, like the application of Theseus' ship at the end of chapter three, but the stories that are shared are on point and they're well-written. I also don't love the brain science section and wish you would have gone just a little bit deeper on the topic of personal core values, but that doesn't diminish the powerful ideas that are presented in the rest of this book. The understanding of homeostasis versus allostasis alone was an influential concept for me and made the book worth the cost of picking it up on Amazon, in my opinion. Now, the mindset and identity sections were definitely my favorites. They're very well done. I didn't really care so much for the action section, but that's likely because that's what about 90% of the productivity and self-help books that I read focus on. It's probably not complete without that section, and I feel the book had a very nice natural progression before that. Now, overall, I think this book is really good, but not great, and I'm gonna give this book four stars. I'm very glad that I read it, and I would recommend it to anyone who's needing some help navigating change in their life. It's a fairly short book and an easy read, but don't rush through it if you really wanna get the most out of it. There are some really powerful ideas here, and I love how focused it is when the topic of change could easily have gone in about a thousand different directions. But it just doesn't quite get to the point of a five-star book, in my opinion. Nevertheless, it's a very good book and I'd recommend adding it to your library. Now, before we go, I mentioned at the beginning, I've got a little bit of a different way that I take notes on the books that I read. And if you wanna learn more about my process, I've got a video where I walk through the whole thing. But the end result is a mind map that looks something like this. And I literally have hundreds of these in my Obsidian Vault. Now, if you wanna download the mind map version of my notes for this book, you can do that for free using the link in the description below this video. You can also sign up for my newsletter where I occasionally share these mind map files as well as tips on how to use Obsidian to improve your productivity and creativity workflows. You can sign up for that newsletter which goes out every Monday at obsidianuniversity.com. 